God despises syncretism, taking the practices of ancient pagan religions and thinking you can sanctify it to honor God. And yet Tilden Edwards, the head of the Shalem Institute in Washington, one of the most prominent contemplative training centers in the country, has said, what makes a practice Christian or not Christian isn't its source, it's its intent. So what Tilden Edwards, along with many others in the emergent and contemplative movement are saying, is that we can embrace these practices, these principles, these teachings from ancient pagan mystery religions, sanctify them by sprinkling Christian terminology. If our intent is to honor God with it, then by definition they assume God will accept it and be pleased with it, not according to the Word of God. The Word of God says they are bringing strange fire into the church. The term New Age was exposed and the teachings were exposed in the 1980s, early 1990s. So the New Age cleverly morphed into new gospel, new spirituality. The New Age meets and merges, not emerges, but merges as the emergent emerging church. It's really the merging church. The new spirituality has nothing new about it. It's simply the old occultism that has been around since the Garden of Eden. It is found now in many different forms. It was called New Age. Now they figured out that's no longer a popular term. So they call it new spirituality. But in the church, we find it in many different forms. The emerging movement, the positive confession movement, the word faith movement, the contemplative movement, the uh, new apostolic reformation. So basically it's simply incorporating elements of old ancient occultism that devalue the Bible and are now surging and emerging, if you will, within the church itself. We have a very clever adversary who knows how to redefine and reinvent the Christian faith. And that's what we're watching happen right before our very eyes. In the world religions, there's always been this, uh, this fascination with the mystical. And uh, it's, it's kind of a hallmark of what they believed. A lot of the mysticism that came through Catholicism, but those things were kind of more out on the margins. Uh, they were only in, in particular groups of people within denominations. What we're finding now is that that is hitting the mainstream of Christianity. Barbara Marx Hubbard, probably the, almost the, the matriarch of today's contemporary New Age movement, has a book called Emergence, the shift from ego to essence. 10 Steps to the Universal Human. David Spangler, father of the New Age, called the shaman of the New Age, has a book called Emergence, the Rebirth of the Sacred, the God Within. The book As Above, So Below, written by the editors of New Age magazine, talk about the emergent spirituality. And they talk all about contemplative prayer and esoteric Christianity. Thomas Keating is a Trappist monk who in the 60s realized that there was a tremendous influence of Eastern mysticism with the young people. Keating popularized the movement called centering where you take a single word and begin using that as a mantra to focus and center your mind and your spirit through which you can open up and commune with the divine. And will also, like the Eastern meditation, open up the serpent power, the kundalini demonic force to rise up. One thing up. That, that permeates all throughout those different belief systems is a movement towards an experience-based kind of Christianity. They want something that is different from what they can just hold in their hands or read in, a, in the Bible. They want something that is sensual. We are being told, not only by the New Age, New Spirituality, but by many who are now in leadership, that we need to have spiritual experiences for an authentic faith. As far as Christianity is concerned, the corruption is coming into the church from outside. We're embracing those things that God speaks nothing of in Scripture unless He's speaking against it. And a lot of Christian leaders are really devaluing the Bible. And that's really very common in the, in the merging, emerging New Spirituality church. The Bible is really reliable, and you always have to defer to the Bible, not to spiritual experience. One of the biggest movements going on in the church right now is how do we unite the various faiths? Um, so you find a great deal of outreach on, on behalf of uh, various groups, Roman Catholicism right at the forefront of it. Uh, but Rick Warren is a big advocate of this as well. And so the idea that we can merge varying beliefs since we all believe in God. Peter Drucker, one of the business geniuses, 
who's helped develop many programs. He was one of the key mentors of Rick Warren, who used his uh, methodology of a three-legged stool, bringing in government, the financial aspect, and the churches to help bring in a new model for the church and to grow the church. It evolved into something that uh, was seeker-friendly, that wasn't interested in necessarily bringing in absolute truth or study of the word, but something that appealed to young people, that appealed to the felt needs of the individuals in the community. Hey everybody, welcome back to Magic Orthodoxy. My name is David and this is Cartomancy. Oh, Cartomancy, oh, what is that? Well, Cartomancy is fortune telling or it's divination using a deck of cards. So it's similar to uh, maybe tarot, what you're familiar with, but in tarot, you actually use a specific tarot deck to tell the future, but in cartomancy, you're actually using the European 14th century playing cards that you're familiar with. Again, cartomancy, it's fortune telling with a deck of cards. Uh, it appeared soon after playing cards were first introduced in Europe in the 14th century. Now, cartomancy uses a standard deck of playing cards. It was the most popular way of providing fortune telling in and around the 18th and 19th and even the 20th century. Practitioners of cartomancy are generally known as cartomancers or card readers or sometimes just readers. Um, cartomancy is one of the oldest and the most common forms of fortune telling. It's similar to tarot a little bit, but it's... Pastor Rick, it's all about winning the hand you're dealt in life. So we're going to play a little poker with Pastor Rick. You say five cards mm -hmm. that can make up our identity right. so what's first well the first card is your chemistry I call it your chemistry and your chemistry involves your DNA uh, your hormones your your biology your health your strengths your it's your body because everything you're gonna do in life you're gonna do through your body and if your body's in pain you got to deal with that first right if you've got allergies that affects you if yes. you've got if you've got imbalances that affects you if it, our bodies for good or for bad affect our identity so you got to start with that card okay so what's the fourth card in our hand now the fourth card is I call your consciousness interesting your consciousness is the way you talk to yourself Ooh, good your consciousness is <laughs> the story you tell yourself when you have a habit or I have a habit that I, I don't like and I'm being tempted to go to this habit over and over and over the key to changing a habit is not to resist it, but to replace it. Not to resist, but refocus. If a guy's having a problem with pornography and he's watching TV, he doesn't just say, no, I don't want this, I don't want this. He just flips the channel. The moment you change the channel, it, the, the temptation loses its power on you. Do not, listen, here's a pastor telling this, do not resist temptation. Do not resist temptation. Yeah. And let me tell you why. Says the pastor. Yeah, let me tell you why. <laughs> what you resist persists. But because the whole time you're focused on it. What you need to do is just change your focus. And this is taking your conscious and saying, I'm going to renew my mind. Let me ask you this on, on several levels. Sure. You, you think as a pastor mm -hmm. that it is possible that people are born with a natural desire. It's possible but still it would be a sin that, that, that God would create a, a sort of situation whereby someone could have feelings and desires that are natural to them. Yeah. But it's still a sin. You know what? I don't have it all figured out. And what so, about the love part, though? Because the, the, I, I hear the AIDS it's part. It's not illegal to, to love somebody. But you think it's a sin? I don't, no, it's not a sin to love somebody. It might be a sin to have sex with them. Wow. It might be. Yeah. Are gay people going to hell? No, not because they're gay. Everybody, we go to hell because we choose to reject the grace of God. The only way you can go so to hell is if, you reject the grace of God. If a gay person accepts, accepts Christ. Jesus Christ, he's going to heaven. Okay. And by so doing, bringing down any emphasis on the gospel or the solid objective source of truth of the word, because that wasn't going to sell a church program. There is now a new reformation being headed up not surprisingly, by Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, who is seeking now to bring his peace plan into a global perspective, where he hopes to recruit a billion people who will bring about the end of all the world's ills. When we look at the term New Reformation, we have to think of where did it first show up. It showed up with Robert Schuller, this 1982 book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, talking about God's dream. 
Rick Warren now has a peace plan that he calls God's dream for you and the world. Oprah is using the term God's dream. The Bible has told us that one of the signs of the end of the age would be a very clear, very deliberate move to an establishment of a one world government, which would be brought into a cohesiveness and a unity through a one world religion, a utopian religion. And it is not coincidental that the occultists and the New Agers for many, many years have been looking for the formation of a one world government a one world religion which would bring a utopia on earth. What we see in modern ecumenism and the call towards all faiths becoming one and all the various Christianity becoming one, this is exactly what we know that the end times would be like. The idea of a consolidated belief system. The church somehow thinks in, in some quarters that it has the, the task of setting up the kingdom of God. It's Jesus who sets up his own kingdom. And we are the ones who inherit it with Jesus who ushers it in, not the other way around. We don't usher it in for him. The kingdom of God is not something that's made with man's hands. We aren't building it. It's not something that, that uh, we have a hand in making because the Bible says we inherit that. So how do you inherit something if you're the one who builds it? There is now a counterfeit kingdom of God that is being brought in by the radical Pentecostals and Charismatics who came out of the Azusa Street Revival, which then became, in the 1940s and 50s, the Latter Rain Movement. Uh, an offshoot from them became the Manifested Sons of God. And part of the aberrant theology from a man named William Branham, one of the teachings he had was that we were going to manifest as sons of God. We were going to become divine, and that we were going to bring in the kingdom of God before Jesus came. I really believe that a lot of the men that are involved in leadership in the church that are bringing these new teachings in believe that what they're doing is of God. For all I know, they have a voice that's directing them. They just haven't tested the spirits because I can tell you that what they are teaching is contrary to the scripture. Unless you are looking to the word of God, you have no way of testing what these prophets who are coming predicting and prophesying in the name of God are saying. If you do not know solid doctrine, if you do not know the signs of the end of the age, if you do not know what the original in scripture looks like, how will you test when the counterfeits come claiming to be from the word of the living God? The Bible should act as our anchor or as our mooring uh, so that we're just not carried around wherever the, the tide wants to take us. The Bible is supposed to be the foundation for everything that we believe. It's the only way of knowing truth. Foundationally, if we don't and can't rely upon the Bible, then it's going to give rise to all kinds of odd doctrines and belief of end times. And it's what's given rise to, uh, to much of the, the bad teaching that is in the church. Uh, bad eschatology gives rise to very bad doctrine. Traditional teaching of scripture is that Jesus will come back at a predefined time. Um, the message of much of the church nowadays doesn't believe that, nor does it teach it. The devil doesn't want people to be focused on what's to come. He wants us to be very much engaged with the things going on down here on earth. If we believe that Jesus could come back at any moment, it's going to change the way that we engage this world. But if you believe that Jesus can't come back to the earth, until we fix everything down here and that everybody's going to eventually get to heaven anyway, you can go ahead and take a very, very uh, uncommitted view of your Christianity. You can get very involved in the things of this world. But if you believe that Jesus could come back at any minute, it'll absolutely revolutionize the way that you engage the culture and the world around you. Our young people are not going to be reached through emergent gimmicks and techniques, through candles or labyrinths, through pizza parties, through chanting parties, through meditation techniques and yoga seminars. These young people aren't going to be reached because you are conforming the gospel to their culture, but because you are bringing the gospel to them in their culture and saying to them, the Lord is relevant for you today, for his gospel, his word of salvation is what will bring you into that relationship with God without the use of gimmicks or occult techniques. What makes a Christian? Not the church that you go to. 
It's not the, the creed or doctrine that you hold to. It's not your education. It's very simply, do you believe what the Bible says? Some Christians uh, are practicing in church and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like church is having like women's yoga classes and stuff. So the word yoga means union. And union, it's referring to the, the, the spiritual goal and agenda of yoga, the word union. What they mean is that there's a universal impersonal spirit called Brahman, which is this force in the universe and the substance of reality, the substance of the universe. And the goal of yoga is to bring your individual self into union with this universal consciousness, this impersonal field of consciousness, where you recognize that your personal sense of self, your Atman, as they would call it, is ultimately Brahman, is ultimately God. It's ultimately an expression of this um, oversoul of the universe. And so when you reach this state of consciousness of realizing that, they call that moksha. What would you say to a Christian who says, yeah, but I'm just doing the, the, the stretching. stretching? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the stretches, aside from the fact that um, Regular stretching has been just effective, has been shown to be just effective in treating things like back pain as yoga. The the issue with yoga, I mean, one issue is that it's idolatry because the positions that you're doing in yoga, they're they're meant to honor the sun, the moon, um, pagan deities, the, the the polytheistic gods of Hinduism. They're named after polytheistic gods of Hindu, Hinduism. And when you hit these positions, what they're meant to do is invoke the properties of these gods or the power of these gods. Okay. So here you are, you're in a, a yoga studio, there's incense burning, you got you know, idols up everywhere, you got some you know, demonized yoga instructor, who knows what, and then you have, but then, you have but, then you're in a, but then you're in a trance-like state of consciousness, okay? Your brain waves are changing, you're, you're, you're an open door, you're more susceptible, your defense systems have been brought down, and you're opening yourself up to demonic possession, demonic oppression. And people are saying, well, no, you're, you're, just, you're, just, you're crazy. Okay, well, let's look to something called the Kundalini effect in yoga, where people who practice yoga, they believe they feel this serpent of energy, as they'll call it, crawling up the base of your spine, through your chakras, your energy systems of your body, up to your third eye, and then illuminating your third eye and enlightening you. His brand of yoga called dynamic meditation is a new age combination of Hinduism and psychotherapies. This exercise involving rigorous breathing and hyperventilation is designed to arouse the serpent force called Kundalini, which the gurus believe lies coiled at the base of the spine. I did dynamic meditation every day. We also called it kundalini meditation. Your head and into your body, and you just breathe. Problem, you get like side effects like migraine headaches, like depression, like suicidal thoughts, like sickness. And you feel there's people, there's all blogs of people asking, like, I have the Kundalini effect after doing yoga. I don't feel like, like I'm even. Yoga's jacking me up. Yeah. Yeah. Like they'll say, like, I don't even feel like I'm alone in my own body anymore. Like I need help. And, and the reason why is because you're getting, you're getting demons. And proof of this is in Hinduism, there's something called uh, siddhis. There's primary and secondary siddhis, which are meant to be essentially consequences of practicing yoga. When you practice it properly, an effect of that would be a primary siddhi or a secondary siddhi, such as the secondary ones would be um, being able to revisit the past lives of the gods and like see in trance what they did. Being able to leave your body and go into another person's body, okay? Being able to read another person's mind. So yogic traditions tell us 
that when yoga is done properly, the way it's supposed to be done, you're gonna be able to do things that the Bible tells us are only possible with demonic power, okay? Right. And you're gonna feel messed up, you're gonna feel like you're not alone in your body, and then you're gonna need help. From, you're gonna need help from people getting delivered. Like, oh, so unlink in the name of Jesus Christ. I come out and go into the abyss. Down, evil Kundalini spirit. Evil Kundalini serpent. I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. I command you to uproot you yourself. Unlink yourself. with your brother. Stop encouraging one another. Come out and go into the abyss. Come out right now in the name of Jesus Christ and go into the abyss. Evil Kundalini serpent. Come out right now. Loose her in the name of Jesus Christ. I command you. Loose her in the name of Jesus serpent. Come out right now. Loose her in the name of Jesus Christ. Loose her in the name of Jesus Christ. Kundalini serpent. Come out right now. Loose her. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. Kundalini serpent, come out and go into the abyss in the name of Jesus Christ. Evil Kundalini spirit, come out right now. Kundalini serpent, come right now. Loose in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. Evil Kundalini serpent, come right now. Loose in the name of Jesus Christ, and go into the abyss in the name of Jesus. Loose in the name of Jesus Christ. Kundalini, come right now. Loose in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. Kundalini serpent, come right now. Loose in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. Kundalini, come right now. Go into the abyss in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ. Go into the abyss in the name of Jesus. Come out, come out, 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 come out, out. self pity, out. sorrows, come out, take every legion with you right now, out, 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 out of the come mouth, out. out of the belly, out of the mouth, come out, 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 come out of the feet, out of the legs, out of the arms, out of the pelvis, out of his stomach, out of his chest. Come out, come out, come out, come out. Every legion, every unclean spirit, every wicked spirit, every demonic spirit, come out. Come, come out. together as one, be loose from this body now. Get out, 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 get out. It's dangerous. Yeah. You're just opening up the door to the demonic. Yeah, you're opening up the door to the demonic and uh you can't separate it from its theological, spiritual roots. The whole purpose of yoga is not stretching. It's psycho-spiritual, it's moksha. It's yeah. sam another one is samsara. It's leaving this cycle of death and rebirth, leaving the cycle of reincarnation. And you do that by reaching a certain level of consciousness, a certain state of self-awareness of yourself as the creator, and now you no longer have a need to reincarnate. So those are the two goals of yoga. <laughs> it's not just to go get fit and you know wear Lululemons or whatever. <laughs> You know, and look like relatively cute because you like yoga pants. Like that's not what it's about. It's like Some of the best-selling books of all time that are explicitly New Age and occult. You have 40% of Americans who say they meditate at least once a week. You have 36 million Americans practicing yoga. As a, it's a $10 billion industry. The crystal industry is a billion dollar industry. The psychic services industry, things like palmistry, tarot card reading, astrology readings, it's a $2 billion industry. You have. You talk about Oprah is a Pied Piper of the New Age. Explain that. Yeah, she is. Um, I don't think there's anybody who has done more to promote New Age spirituality in the West than Oprah Winfrey. And that's a very strong claim, but from her programs like Super Soul Sunday, the books she promotes and advertises, I'm talking millions and millions, tens of millions of New Age books have been promoted and sold through her book club, through her programs. She's really running the show in the West right now. Um, some of the most influential people in our society right now 
are teaching this stuff. People like Russell Brand, Jim Carrey, Ellen DeGeneres, Oprah Winfrey. So this is actually coming down from the highest levels of so, social So influence. you say this is the goal. What, what is the overall goal of this? The goal is, on a personal level, the goal is to reach a state where you realize that you are God. Reaching that state of consciousness, which they call Christ consciousness or God consciousness, that's the goal of the New Age movement. The New Age movement is not just one set of pagan beliefs and practices. It's a compilation, a mixing pot that draws from things like Buddhism, Hinduism, mysticism includes practices like crystal healing or Reiki, astrology, meditation, yoga, and so forth. Some common New Age doctrines would include things like reincarnation, or the belief that man is intrinsically divine by nature, or the belief that all paths ultimately lead back to God in the end. And the end goal of the New Age movement is to reach a state of enlightenment or spiritual awakening. While running the Oprah show and other shows like Belief and Super Soul Sunday that maintain all religious paths or valid paths to God, she confidently and repeatedly asserts herself as being a Christian while holding the following beliefs. God is an energy or impersonal force in the universe. Jesus didn't come here to die for our sins but to show us how to live from Christ consciousness. Jesus isn't the only path to God or to heaven. Man is divine by nature and not separated from God through sin. There is no text, such as the Bible, that defines once for all doctrine and theology. We can create an understanding of God and spirituality that suits our preferences. And lastly, reincarnation. A person cannot hold a single one of these beliefs and be considered a Christian, let alone all of them at the same time. I am a Christian who believes that there are, there are certainly many more paths to God other than Christianity. I'm a free-thinking Christian who believes in my way, but I don't believe that it's the only way. What I believe is that Jesus came to show us Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is the idea that Jesus came here to show us how to raise our consciousness to his level where we step into unity with the God who already dwells within us. So what she does is redefine God in such a way as to imply that man is inherently divine in and of himself by saying God is the very substance of man, and then says Jesus was here to show us how to self-realize this divinity by shifting our consciousness so that we become aligned with the substance and energy of God that is already within us. This is a Jesus of Hinduism, not a Jesus of history. What is your definition of God? God is the highest place within each and every one of us. It's our divine self. I define God as an energy, a spiritual energy. It has no denomination. It has no judgments. It has an energy that when we're connected to it, we know why we're here and what we're here to do. Well, he is my beloved. He is my most intimate beloved, my friend, the one I look to in everything. I wouldn't try to define him because no one knows God but God. He is beyond even our idea of the beyond. What is your definition of God? All that is. Everything. Everything. <sighs> Breath. Life. Everything. I, I, I can't even... Just get Webster's Dictionary and throw it on the floor. <laughs> it's everything. 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 And God is in everything. God is everything. Not only in, is everything. In Oprah's book, The Wisdom of Sundays, she says, My definition of God is the all. The all in the all, through the all, above the all. So my question is to you, Oprah, how have you reconciled these spiritual teachings with your Christian beliefs? Uh, I reconciled it because I was able to open my mind about the, um, the absolute indescribable hugeness of that which we call God. Um, I took God out of the box because I grew up in the Baptist church and there were, you know, rules and, you know, belief sy systems and doctrine. And I love this quote that uh, Eckhart has. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes in uh, chapter one where he says, Man made God in his own image. The eternal, the infinite, and unnameable was reduced to a mental idol that you had to believe in and worship as my God or our God. Now I think that's very eloquently put uh, by Eckhart Tolle in chapter one. Jesus came us to show us the way of the heart and that what Jesus was saying that to show us the higher consciousness that we're all talking about here. Jesus came to say, look, I'm gonna live in the body, in the human body, and I'm gonna show you how it's done. These are some, some principles and some laws that you can use to live by to, to know that way. And when I, when I started to recognize that, that Jesus didn't come, in my belief, 
even as a Christian, I don't believe that Jesus came to start Christianity. So this is not about trying to tell you how to believe. And you say Eckhart uh, uh, gave you a different way or reading the book showed you a different way to look at Jesus Christ? Yes, absolutely. How so? Um, I've always um, tried to find a, a deeper inner connection with the purpose that Christ had here on earth. And all my life I, I thought it was just for him to die on the cross for my sins. But I now recognize that Jesus actually taught me Christ consciousness is who to be fully human Hello. is to be Christ-like. <laughs> yeah. And so it's not uh, uh, any time that you uh, not follow your spiritual calling that you are lesser of a human. Yes, I'm Christian too, and I got that a long time ago. Uh, I was, mentioned this also in this book uh, called um, Discover the Power Within You by Eric Butterworth where he talks about the Christ consciousness. And up until then, I was like you, Margit. I thought Jesus came, died on the cross, that Jesus' being here was about his death and dying on the cross, when it really was about him coming to show us how to do it, how to be, to show us the Christ consciousness that he had and that that consciousness abides with all of us. Yes. That's yes. what I got. Yes. That's Tonight, what. we're taking a chance as we tap into our spiritual side. Anybody know what their spiritual side is? That's good. I am not talking about religion. I, I, I am not talking about religion. I, I am a Christian. That is my faith. I'm not asking you to be a Christian. If you want to be one, I can show you how. But it is not required. I have respect for all faiths, all faiths. Now, there is a force, energy, consciousness, divine thread, I believe, that connects all spiritually to all of us, to something greater than ourselves. My favorite Bible verse, because I am Christian, Notice how Oprah Winfrey continues to call herself a Christian. She is not. It's a form of witchcraft to permeate the minds of the listeners who do follow Christ but happen to be either lukewarm or very weak in their understanding of the scriptures. So their guard goes down when she claims to be a Christian. But she happens to be one of the most powerful witches in the nation saints of god do not be deceived many will call many will say they're of christ but deceive many this tactic is destroying many christians because when they say they're christian immediately the guard goes down just like eve in the garden her guard went down with the serpent saints you better wake up and let's see what these so-called leaders have to say about Oprah. You know, like Joel Olstein or T.D. Jakes. Today we are so honored to have a world changer, a history maker. <laughs> One of the great voices of our generation, Ms. Oprah Winfrey, is right here on the front row with us. Hey. Dear Oprah, you have inspired an entire generation, informed us, exposed us, and challenged us. You took us places that we would have never been able to go to meet people we would have never been able to meet. Uh, it talks about one of the points it brings out is one of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to live That's and right. that we don't accept that there are diverse ways of being in the world, that there are millions of ways to be a then human how do you being please and, God? and many ways, no, but many paths many to what you call God. That and is her path crazy. might be something else and when she gets there she might call it the light. But her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. And I guess the danger that could be on that, I mean, it's, it sounds great on the onset, but if you really look at both sides, I there could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Right, and you say there isn't only one way. 
there is one way and only one way, and there that is through Jesus. Jesus. There couldn't possibly be with because a million you of people say in the there world. Isn't. There couldn't possibly be. Because you say, you intellectualize it and say there isn't. If no. you don't believe that, you're all buying into Any the religious lies. leaders you see affiliate with this witch, mark them. Period. Notice how many religious figures have to pay homage to Oprah Winfrey. It's like she's the female pope of the New Age movement. If you knew what this woman has done behind closed doors to get her powers, you would probably vomit. She is a very wicked woman beyond your understanding. I would not be surprised if she tries to run for presidency. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but don't be surprised. I'm kind of amazed that... Um, the churches that I've gone to have embraced uh, what I would consider idolatry as far as bringing practices in for martial arts and yoga. <laughs> Those of us that know the word and know God, <laughs> we understand that there can be no other God before him. And this is why Christians, uh, those that profess to serve Christ, cannot participate in yoga. Uh, people like to make yoga an exercise or they're just, you know, body movements and these different things. But that is not true at all. In India, yoga was created to bring a person closer to uh, Kali or to Shiva, uh, the gods that they worship over there. And that's why Kali and Shiva, they're always portrayed with, you know, a, a multiple arms um, and sometimes even multiple legs. And they move these legs and arms in different positions because these positions actually channel spirits. They actually send energies in those shapes uh, to uh, other dimensions or other planes or other realms, however you want to say it, they send these shapes off in worship to these beings, Shiva and Kali. And, you know, the ultimate goal of uh, yoga, of course, is to achieve the state of uh, Samadhi, which is the final state where yourself disappears and you become an instrument of channeling for these these specific gods. So this is why we don't do it uh, as Christians for Sarita Jakes to bring yoga and uh, them to bring yoga right into the potter's house and basically basically have all of their followers uh, channeling these spirits and doing these positions. I mean, this is the most demonic thing I've seen in church in a long time. Raise your hand if you have a personal relationship with stress. Okay. Oh, I, I, think, I think we all can say at least sometimes. Sure, that's fine. Okay. So let me just let you know the purpose of yoga. Yoga is about creating a personal environment within yourself where stress does not exist. You allow yourself to create peace within yourself, a place where stress does not exist. And that's very important for our health because we always create the environment for stress to exist. So what is the balance of that? Yoga is one of those ways that you can achieve that balance. The definition of yoga is oneness. So the part of us that is made in the image of God, that higher part of ourself, connecting with the flesh, those temptations and things like that that we deal with because we're on the earthly plane. The connection of those two parts of ourselves is the definition of yoga. It's not about you can put your head behind your foot behind your head or twist yourself up in a pretzel. That comes at times because you create that environment within yourself for peace and oneness. So the purpose of yoga at the end of the day is to create that peace within yourself where you are one with yourself. Okay? So um, let's please repeat after me. Dear stress. Dear, Dear stress. stress. Let's break up. Let's, let's break, break up. up. That's a very serious conversation. <laughs> As you breathe, you want to do a scan from head to toe. Do I feel tension in my forehead, my eyes, my nose, my cheeks? Relax. I want you to allow yourself to create a happy place for yourself. 
Think about what that place looks like. What time of day is it? Walk around in your happy place. Look up above you, what do you see? That thing above you that will make you so happy. Your left shoulder. Inhale. To your right. Take a breath here, relax those shoulders. Inhale to the apple. Exhale and relax. Inhale, raise the head up. And exhale. How's that feel? Let's roll shoulders back a little bit. And let's roll the shoulders forward a bit. I give this brief message because of the two greatest commandments. It says in Matthew 22, verses 33 through 40, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Going down the street and noticed another church in my city. The closest church to my home, right here in my own neighborhood, has a sign out front, a big neon vinyl ba banner that says free Zumba and yoga inside this church. Brethren, there's no such thing as a Christianized version of yoga, nor is there anything that is called holy yoga. You see, God alone is holy, and calling yoga holy yoga is a form of blasphemy. Yoga is an abomination unto the Lord. It has no place inside a church building or within the body of Christ. Yoga is not an exercise practice, it's a religious practice from a system that hates our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that each yoga pose or yoga position is actually a posture of worship to any of their 330 million Hindu gods? As another one once said, and I quote, the practice of yoga is pagan at best and occult at worst. Its teachings emanate from the Eastern religion. 
Hi, Brooke with Holy Yoga here. Um, the word guru. We put out a t-shirt last year that across the chest boldly it says Jesus is my guru. And um, that's technically teacher in Sanskrit. Guru means to a teacher in Sanskrit. But um, Jesus, it's 68 times in the NIV alone, is referred to as teacher. And what's interesting about the word guru is gu, the, the root word of guru is gu, and that means dark, and ru means light. So it's, in essence, a guru is a teacher that brings from dark into the light. So Jesus really is, if we are practitioners of, of the, the faith of Christ and we're following Christ and we're being taught by Christ, being transformed by the Word of God in the vein of Christ and, and submitting to Him as Lord and Savior, we are under the teaching of the guru, which is Jesus Christ. Today we're going after the idea of Om. Om, classically in the yogic perspective, is that it is the vibrational hum of the universe. That at the base of everything there is this hum or vibration that is the unifying sound of the, of the universe, is what the yogic perspective of uh, Om is. So they practice the Om in order to um, combine energies in class, basically. So it's not about a deity. It's not necessarily about worship at all. What it is is it's, okay, there is this natural hum of the universe, this creative hum, and what we want to do is we want to ohm so that all of us kind of get on the same collective page. That's the, really what ohm is in a yoga class that you would find anywhere, at a gym or a yoga studio. The idea is to bring the energy together. For holy yoga, we tend not to om only because it just lends itself to more question than answer. And so, for our for our perspective, prayer it does the same thing. Uh, so we're we don't usually use om, but there's nothing inherently wrong with om as well. They think they can modify something and call it Christ-like. Um, uh, Christ, in in the Bible, it tells it tells us that we need to abandon, turn our back on those ways, not modify them to make them what we want to do. When you stand before Jesus on Judgment Day. What are you going to say to him? Oh, Jesus, I knew you would understand that I still like to practice yoga. I just didn't do the meditation part. I just did the physical part. Even though that is um, part of Hinduism, you know, I didn't practice the part of meditation part. I just practiced the physical part of Hinduism that is for the stretching to help awaken the Kundalini. Do you think Jesus is going to say on Judgment Day, Oh, I understand you modifying it. You know, um, I I'm okay with that. Uh, for people to say, Oh, well, you know, as long as you don't do the meditation part, it's okay. Well, the physical exercises are actually to help awaken that kundalini energy. And so you're inviting um, demonic forces in your life. What if you're, you know, I mean, one of the poses is a cobra pose, okay? Cobra, snake, Satan. Uh, 
And the other one is, is the child pose. Well, the child pose is like a worship pose. And those are two basic poses that, you know, all yoga students do. So you're going to go into a cobra pose and that's not going to offend Jesus. And you're going to go into a worship pose called the child pose and since it is Hinduism that is the basis, you're basically bowing down to Satan. And so, so that's okay. Jesus isn't going to have a problem with that either. Maybe that's it. Maybe they still need to, to be delivered from the spirits. I know that after I had come back to following Jesus, I needed deliverance. I needed deliverance from several spirits that had, you know, uh, I guess the proper term is demonized. And, um, you know, I had gone down the path so far as, you know, um, in Buddhism where there is an awakening. Um, it's not full enlightenment, but there is what they call an awakening to the true nature. And, um, it's a spirit that makes you feel peaceful and that, you know, you're all one and you're connected to everything in the universe and there is a energy that flows through all of us and that we're all God. If you're angry about this video, maybe this is speaking to one of those spirits in you that is defiant against Christ. Uh, I ask you to consider that. Uh, because every time we run into opposition, it's either our flesh or a demon that has been um, allowed to enter us through sin demon. that you need deliverance. Um, because uh, demons will um, be okay with you going to church a lot of times. Um, it's just that they won't want to make you... They, they'll be opposed to you becoming an active Christian. If you find yourself having problems um, uh, testifying or having problems living righteously, <clears throat> I would um, look to not just your flesh, but perhaps you've opened a, the door to something more that has taken up residency and that you need to be delivered from. So um, hopefully this helps you. Uh, for those of you watching, um, uh, sometimes it takes much prayer and fasting. So remember that Jesus said that to some of his disciples that who couldn't cast out uh, one of the spirits, he said some spirits take much prayer and fasting to cast out. Through so the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice, we can be delivered from this. Amen. Hey guys, Steve here. Some of you may know me as being the creator of the Facebook page and website called Spirit Science and Metaphysics. And some of you may know me as being an admin and author on the Spirit Science Facebook page and website. If you've been following me on social media recently, you'll know that I've completely renounced the New Age. I'm no longer writing New Age articles and I'm actually a born again Christian now. So I just want to share with you, you know, my story, my testimony, basically what happened. I was actually born and raised in a Christian household. I grew up going to church pretty regularly, but I never considered myself to be a Christian. It was just something that I was exposed to and familiar with, but it was never something that was an active reality in my life. My journey down the rabbit hole really started when I was in high school, when I first saw an episode of Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a television show that presents all the evidence that ancient man was visited in the past by extraterrestrials who they thought were, you know, gods descending down from the sky. So this completely blew my mind and called into question, you know, the biblical worldview that I had been raised with. So I started to research aliens obsessively, and I bought the first three seasons of Ancient Aliens and watched them through, like, front to back, over and over and over again. I also started researching things like channeling, astral projection, hidden knowledge, spiritual science, uh, mysticism, and all this stuff. And what started off as study turned into practice, and I started practicing things like tarot card reading, uh, meditation, lucid dreaming, uh, astral projection, 
and during this time I was also in school studying to be a philosophy major. And so when you're having, you know, out-of-body experiences and in school studying philosophy, the idea of Christianity just seems naive and childish and I used to look down on Christians as being, you know, thoughtless and intellectually inferior, I guess. But the problem was, in my studies, I would see near-death experiences, people giving testimonies of having seen Jesus in heaven, in the afterlife, or having seen hell, and then Jesus pulled them up out of hell. And whenever they would tell their story, they would be in tears, they'd be crying, and I would cry. I would be moved from their testimony. So I was, you know, really into the New Age, and I'm really into philosophy, but at the same time, in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, there's something unique and different and special and pure and holy about Jesus. And I couldn't put my finger on it, and I couldn't reconcile it with what I was researching and experiencing in the New Age. So I just basically kind of put it on the back shelf, but I always knew there was something different to the person of Jesus. And then after about four to five years of research, I started a Facebook page in November of 2012 called Spirit Science and Metaphysics. It blew up pretty quick. I started to connect with other admins from other Facebook pages. We would share each other's stuff. And in January of 2014, I launched my website, spiritsciencemetaphysics.com, which some of you may be familiar with. And because of all of the Facebook pages I had connections to, uh, my website was a huge success. I was getting about... 150,000 to 250,000 website views a day and I had articles that were you know just going viral so I was basically making a killing for myself off of ad revenue and so being 22 years old I went out and bought myself a sports car and you know greed and materialism had a really big hold on my life I was obsessed with making money to be honest I thought that this was God rewarding me for serving humanity I felt like by teaching new age doctrine I was actually helping humanity awaken and, and raise its consciousness. And so I was writing articles for my own site, and for a while I was also writing articles for the Spirit Science website, which some of you may know me from. And during this whole time, too, I was still trying to figure out God, trying to understand Jesus, trying to understand, you know, where Jesus fit into the puzzle and where God fit into the puzzle. And I used to believe that God was basically the energy of the universe. I used to think that... To have a relationship with God meant to have a relationship with your inner self and that all you had to do to have a personal relationship with God is to just meditate and tap into that inner stillness, that inner silence. And in the summer of 2015, I decided to buy my first house and uh, here's a picture of it here. And this isn't to brag about my former life or something, that's not what this is about. Um, to be honest, I'm ashamed of my former life. This is more so just to share how much greed and materialism and the pursuit of money had a hold on me. And so on the outside, I was living the dream. I had the house I wanted, the car I wanted, all the money I wanted. I had a, a successful website online. I was working from home, all of these things. But I felt unfulfilled inside, and I couldn't understand how I had all this spiritual experience and all this, you know, spiritual knowledge, but on the inside, I was still um, unfulfilled. I just started to explore more open-mindedly the things pertaining to Jesus. And so I began to read the Gospels a little bit. And during this time, I was still writing New Age articles. I was still making lots of money. And I still felt lost inside. And there reached a point where I felt that I had to just be broken before him. Um, so one night, I went outside onto my back balcony of my stupid house. And I just basically fell on my face before him and was weeping like a baby. Um, basically reaching out to him. And when I did this, I felt the atmosphere around me start to change, and I could feel in the air that there was something holy and pure around me, and um, it was also personal. And I knew in that moment that I was in the presence of, of Jesus, and the quality of everything around me changed. Um, it just completely broke me. Um, and I felt like he was showing me himself and showing me who he is and where he stands in relation to, to me and, and to life. And um, I was just getting so many downloads about, oh my gosh, this is so simple, Jesus is the Lord, 
Jesus is the Son of God. It's not some complex, mystical thing. And when I was in his presence, I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. And uh, how it sounded like um, the crickets and uh, the leaves on the trees and the sounds that were outside in nature, they were all... Um, pointing towards him. They were all glorifying him. And I was witnessing it. And, uh, and after that experience, I, uh, I went back inside and I started to think about all of the, the New Age stuff I'd been involved with. And, um, I was just having light bulbs go off in my head, like, oh my gosh, that's what that is, that's a deception, that's a lie. And, uh, I never wrote another New Age article, um, from that day forward. Uh, in fact, drinking stopped, smoking stopped, pornography stopped, sex stopped, and addictions were just falling off, like, immediately, right after one experience, and... For the first time in my life, I had a conviction to live righteously and to live a holy life before God. And when I was in the New Age, you know, the topic of sin doesn't even come up. It, people don't have a concept of, of sin. And I had a conviction of sin immediately after that experience. Um, I basically just cut all of my work ties, stopped writing New Age occult articles, and I, I deleted all the ones on my site that were affiliated with the New Age. I threw all the idols out of my house, I burnt all of my occult and new age books, and I started to do a lot of heavy research into topics that I previously thought were safe, like astral projection, channeling, aliens, and I started to see them through this new spiritual lens that I had. I felt like something had been awakened within me, and I was like looking at all this stuff and being like, wow, this is a bunch of crap. And because I wasn't writing any new age articles anymore, um, my income got cut by 97%, so I had to sell my house, I had to sell my car, and I was glad to. And so for the last few months, I've been getting my feet under me and, and studying scripture, and I got baptized about three weeks ago. And I actually have a new website too, it's called ExposingTheNewAge.com. And I just want to leave you guys with uh, one last thing, and I want you guys to know that God is not an energy blob. God is not some kind of impersonal force. God is not prana or, you know, some kind of void. God is a personal being who loves you and sees you and has a purpose for you and has a will for you. And it's his promise to you that if you seek him diligently and sincerely that he will reveal himself to you. Yoga is becoming increasingly popular all over the world. Yoga integrates poses and breathing techniques to cultivate physical and mental well-being. Yoga has many proven health benefits, from reducing body mass and the risk of heart disease to relieving stress and improving overall well-being. Yoga is great for people of all ages. Here are the 5 best yoga apps for you. 1. Yoga.com Learn the correct way to do hundreds of yoga poses with the Yoga.com Studio app, which gives you high-definition videos to demonstrate postures and breathing exercises. The search feature allows you to find poses based on type, level, and other factors. 2. Yoga Studio Bring class anywhere and practice at your own pace with this yoga app. Choose between one of more than 80 yoga and meditation programs of varying lengths purposes, and intensities. Pose blocks let you learn about popular combinations, such as sun salutations. 3. Daily Yoga Daily Yoga encourages you to make yoga part of your everyday routine. It'll show you more than 500 asanas in more than 200 yoga, pilates, and meditation classes. 4. Simply Yoga I hope you're all doing super well today. My name is Mackenzie and I'm so happy that you're here. So today I'm going to be bringing to you a video all about my top five favorite meditation apps. 
So I feel like meditation apps are amazing, especially if you are a beginner, and they are really helpful for keeping track of your meditations and also giving you some guided meditations or things to help you along the way, especially if you want to maybe manifest something or work on your visualization or maybe even do like a tiny bit of hypnosis. These meditation apps are really, really great for that. So I'm really excited to share them with you guys. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's start with my absolute favorite meditation app. So this app is is called Insight and I absolutely love this app for one reason and one reason only. It's because it shows you exactly how many people are meditating with you at the very moment that you open that app. And I think that's so, so cool. Sometimes when I open the app, it's like over 200,000 people in the whole world meditating at the same time as you. You can also look at people nearby and see if they're meditating with you. Um, and it also gives you some sounds, some music, and some guided meditation. So whatever you want is basically in this app. And yeah, I just love that feature that you can see who exactly is meditating. And you can also send messages and find your friends and you guys can like be accountability buddies and <laughs> make sure that you guys are meditating every day as well. So sometimes we need a little bit of encouragement and a, a little bit of a push into our daily spiritual routines. And these apps are something that I found to be really helpful, really encouraging and just that push that we need. So here are my favorite spirituality apps. Okay, so the first app that I love and that I've been using is Eternal Sunshine. This is one of my favorite apps because in this app, you receive daily notifications on your phone with inspiring quotes and wisdom every day. And I feel like sometimes whatever notification I receive, it's exactly what I need to hear in that moment. So it also has some guided meditations, mantras, like some podcasts and a few other things which I haven't really used but it's created by a songwriter called... So the second app is called Insight Timer, something that I've been using regularly. So this is a free app which it's got thousands and thousands of guided meditations, relaxing songs for sleeping. It's even got courses like podcast type of videos. So there are all kinds of meditations on this app and you can search for a specific amount of time for a meditation. For example, five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour. You can search for what type of meditation you want, such as Zen meditation or like a Kundalini yoga meditation. And you can even join community groups and follow some of these top mindfulness experts. The thing I love about this app is that it tracks your milestones when you are meditating and um, finishing some of the courses. So I think this is very encouraging because I'm not sure if it's just me, but sometimes I get into a stage where I don't meditate for a while and I need that extra encouragement and that extra push. So having these um, like milestones tracked and um, a goal that I wanna reach for meditation, for example, if I just wanted to meditate for 30 minutes a day, I could do it on this app and it would track all of that. And you know, I could see what I am improving on and it's just amazing like I listen to songs on there before I go to sleep I put headphones in I listen to the guided meditations I haven't really delved deep into the courses yet but some of them look absolutely amazing so I highly recommend insight timer app so getting on to the next app, this one is called Moon Plus. So this is something I love. It's actually really, really simple and I check this daily or weekly, but this app tells you the exact time of the moon phase, what moon phase it's in, what moon phases are coming up, whether it's like a dark moon, full moon, new moon, like waxing, crescent. So you're able to track these moon phases. It's honestly so helpful because it lets me like prepare for an upcoming moon ritual. So my full moon routine, my new moon routines and I can really also make the most of the energy that the current moon phase is in. For example, when it's a new moon, it's a great time for new beginnings or if it's a full moon, full moon, it's a great time for letting go. And also when it's a dark moon, you know, it's a time for reflection, going deep within and seeing, you know, what kind of seeds we want to plant for the future. So there's many more moon phases and I think this is just really helpful. If you are into those moon phases, astrology and all that, I think you would love it. So you could clearly see, saints of God, that the war is much more real than you thought. There's so many apps, hypnotism apps, yoga apps, new age apps. So I started to wonder, new age music comes in many different shades of evil. Could it be possible that 
they are putting new age background music in a lot of movies and shows as a way to permeate that spirit into your home without you knowing it. And if the co-founder of Pure Flix is pushing the new age agenda, could some of the movies, most of the movies, I'm not sure, have new age music in them? Saints of God, this war is real. Saints of God, it's time to wake up and get right with Christ. Hey everyone, I'm making this video because I want to talk about my experience with yoga. YouTube keeps cutting me off anyway. So I want to just basically say that it is not what it seems. It's extremely dangerous. I have a lot of experience in this. I was involved in high level occult yoga for a few years and I was doing 15 hours a day of yoga and I was just about ready to completely give my life to this organization and go to India and I was about ready to move to India and I was in India and I had got hit with spiritual warfare while doing this yoga because it opens you up to a different dimension um, and I thought I was becoming enlightened just because something feels good it doesn't mean that it's coming from a good place the deception is just so deep it's unimaginable that it could be anything bad I mean it seems harmless right you're just doing some stretches what's wrong with that we seem totally wacko to even suggest otherwise, but it, it truly is not what it seems. And I was doing this high level yoga and um, I got hit with spiritual warfare, I got hit with physical illness, very serious Morgellons disease. You look at the origins and the roots of yoga and you really go into where it's coming from, it truly is witchcraft. And I'm speaking from experience, high level experience in this. For many years I was involved and I was a poster child for this. And I tell you that it is not what it seems. And um, I came back and I was I was seeing images of Satan with, with a dragon with wings. I didn't even know what it meant. I came to call upon Jesus Christ through this experience for help and healing and hope during the spiritual warfare. And he came. He came and he came strong and through his name he showed me that it's, there, there is no other name. There is no other name that could have done what he did for me. Well, I was felt with just an amazing amount of peace and um, you know, even my parents say they can see a tangible difference. And so what I'd like to just say is that, that Jesus Christ is the way he has shown me out of the deception of, of yoga and what it is and the occult. And I'd just like to say, even if you think I'm totally whacked out crazy, what can yoga can't be that bad, I ask you to look further. And, and you can contact me and I can tell you more details because truly, even if you're feeling good, it has consequences and I would just stay away from it. It is actual witchcraft. My name's Liz. I'm from Scotland. Uh, I'm a Reiki master healer. Today I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. I've come to Christ. Um, I've repented for my sins. Evil, come out in the name of Jesus, we command this demon go. If you read in the Bible, it's a form of um, witchcraft, voodoo and things like that. When I saw that, I went, oh my God. I've been doing that. That day we will know one thing, guilty, guilty, guilty. I am guilty and I deserve hell because God is good and I'm not. I was leading everybody away from Jesus, away from Christ, through other forms of healing. But when I saw Jesus healing on the streets, like, I said, God's spoken to me, God's spoken to me. And it was, it was, I felt the power of his words. It's like these words were his words coming inside me. Is you've got to go and see Torben in, in Denmark. So um, this morning, um, we, Torben and me sat around a table. Come and let's talk. And um, explained the gospel to me through um, over over table with some cups and cakes. And um, he explained it so simply um, that I, anyone, a child could understand it. I use the, uh, the illustration like playing chess. Do you know chess? Uh, 
And playing chess is like, I move, and then Liz move, and then it's my turn, Denmark against Scotland, and it's her turn. <laughs> Am I now allowed to do this? No. no, I'm not allowed to move three times. Why? Because there's rules. What if I really, 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 really want to do it? I'm not allowed to do it still because there's still rules. So I have, those rules are there. I don't have to do with how much I want to do it. It have to do with the rules. So the rules is I need to wait for Liz to move before I'm able to move again. The same way with God. Now Liz is Liz or a person and Liz have sinned. I'm God. It's not good. But I send my son Jesus to die for her sin. Can I then? I save you, I save you. No, I'm not allowed. No matter if I really, really, really want to. God wants to. He wants to save more than we want to save. God wants to, but I'm not allowed because it's not my turn. I have done everything that should be done for my side, send my son Jesus. Now the Bible says it's up to man every place to repent. So Liz have to move before I can move. But I guarantee you, as soon as he move, God is moving. As soon as he repent, God is moving. As soon as he get baptized, God is free. As soon as I lay the hands, God is doing it. Because God is not a problem. God has already paid the price for Liz and for everybody here. Because many think, okay, God, he don't want me, he don't love me, he don't care because he has not come to me. But it's not God's time to move. It's your time. And what I'm going to do now, Liz, I'm going to show you the rules. Because if you don't know the rules, how can you move? But as soon as you know the rules and know the next move, then as soon as you move, God is coming. So the gospel is, this is God and this is man. God created man. And when God created man, man was open to God and man walked with God. And that world was perfect. It was without, before sin came into the world, without uh, divorce and murder and suicide and what we have in the world today. And God created the world and the world was perfect. And man walked with God. This is a good thing. Man walked with God. There was a lot of trees in the garden. There was the tree of life and the tree of good and evil and not other trees. And man was supposed to eat of the tree of life and live forever. But they sinned. They broke God's law by doing what was wrong. And before they were open to God without sin. But now they became close to God with sin. God then said, oh no. If man now take up the tree of life and live forever, we will always have a problem with sin. So because God don't want man who have now sinned to live forever, he throw them out of the garden, away from the tree of life. And suddenly we got a world that was so different, where we were divided from God. They got kids who kill each other, who got kids who kill each other, who got kids who kill each other. So this is where we are now. We are here in a world that's different from the world God created. I also have met many people who said, I cannot believe in God because so much bad is happening. Bah, read the Bible, it's just going to be worse. Because this world's God is Satan. We have fallen and we are divided from God. And the problem is sin, but we don't understand sin. Why? Because if I'm here and should compare myself to people around me, look, I'm not so bad. I'm like him and her and hey, he's worse than me. Hey, I'm not like him. So we are standing here in this world and compare ourselves to people around us and think we are okay. But what if we compare ourselves to God or to man before sin? Suddenly we will get a totally different standard. Sin, we have to talk about that. God. Jesus said, no liars is going to enter the kingdom of God. Every liar is going to get thrown into the hell of fire. 
And we then think, come on, lying is not so bad. It's not like this and this and this. But we have to understand something about sin is really important. It's not so much what you and me and other people have done. It's also who we have done it against. I have a daughter who's 10 years old. If I lie against my daughter, she cannot do anything. She's just 10. If I lie to my wife, I can get a problem. If I lie to my job, boss on a job, I can get fired. If I'm in a court and lie to a judge, I can, I can go to jail. So we are talking about the same thing, you may not lie, but the punishment is so totally different. Not so much what you do, but who do you do it against? You more authority a person has, you stronger is the judgment going to be. So, and the Bible says, when we have lied, we have lied against God, him who gave us life, air to breathe, our mouth to speak to worship him, and we have misused what he had given us against him. And Jesus do not only judge us out of what we do, but also our heart's desire. The Bible said, Jesus said, you will not murder. But I tell you, anybody who have hate in your heart already a murder, you will not do idolatry. But everybody who have looked with lust on somebody have already done it in your heart. So maybe you have not physical, we are not physical being out doing it but it don't matter from God. It's so important because I God and God could take everybody and throw everybody to hell and still be good and still be loving because he's not the problem. We are, we have sinned. The Bible says, have you broken one of the law, you are guilty in the morn. It's not like you can have two out of five and so on. One time, maybe you have not murdered, but have you had sex out of or before marriage, you are guilty in the morn. And it's only one time. God couldn't throw everybody to help, but he didn't. He did something amazing, he did something different. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. He came down here. Not born in sin of a man, born by God. And he walked here among us like a man, without lying, without stealing, without having sex before marriage, looking with lust on somebody, without doing the things we have done. When he was 13 years around, he got baptized in water. When he rose up again, the Spirit of God came over him. And he got filled with the Holy Spirit. From that moment on, he went around preaching the gospel, healing the sick, and commanding people all over to repent. Then he got hung up on the cross, and he died. If he had one time lied, one time stolen, one time done what we have done, he had been guilty. But because he was the only man ever without sin, he rose up and he's now sitting beside God's right hand and he has sent his Holy Spirit down here. What do we want, need to do now? The Bible says we have to be born again. We have to repent toward God. Then we have to get baptized to Jesus Christ and then we receive the Spirit of God. What is repentance? Repentance is to recognize I have sinned, not only against man, but I've sinned against God. I have broken God's law, I have sinned. And you recognize that and you turn away from that sin and ask forgiveness and put your faith in Jesus. When you do that, something amazing is going to happen. God is going to take the stone heart out and give you a new heart because we die with Christ and we rise up with Christ. Babs is Vito Rallo, who is the author of a new book called Exposing the Dangers Behind Martial Arts and Yoga. Let me begin, Vito, if I could, by asking you, what's your personal background in martial arts? Well, my background um, was involved in, in Shotokan Karate, and I was in that for nearly 30 years. I do have extensive work in the martial arts so that I can speak as an expert of it. I was a five-time national wow. champion, um, I was an instructor in two different universities and um, uh, throughout the, the, the history of my involvement in the martial arts, I gained a lot of knowledge of what to do, what not to do. So at some point then you got the revelation that yes. this was not healthy, that That's there was right. dangers in it. So well, when did that happen? Uh, well, well, that happened when uh, about three years ago when I began to do some research. Now, I, I didn't want to do the research because the Lord had pulled me totally out of it. Right. But then there were church people and other people that got me back and there were 
church people that actually got me involved once again in it against my against my true knowledge of, of knowing what was in the martial arts and so from that point on everything seemed to go downhill until the Lord finally delivered me out of the out of the martial arts and the spirits that were behind it. Okay, so what are the specific dangers that you see for Christians or for people involved in martial arts? What, what can happen to them because well, of that? Well, that basically goes back to uh, the history of yoga, but that's where okay. the martial arts came out of. And because the martial arts came out of yoga, they're all connected to Hindu Hinduism, and they're connected to Zen Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And so today, people, no matter what they call the martial arts, they can call it Christian martial arts, Christian yoga, they can say anything that they want about what it is, but in actuality, it's, from, it's a form of Hinduism. Actually, a person is practicing Hinduism in the process of going through that, okay. through any kind of training. Okay, so does that open the door for certain things in their life or certain... What, what yes, you... there, there are spirits that are behind uh, everything that you do. You can't separate the spiritual from the physical. Uh, it's impossible. Even, even other people that are involved, like some of the masters will tell you that Hinduism uh, and yoga are connected just as the martial arts are connected with Zen and Buddhism. So there's no separation of the two because of the spiritual aspects behind them, you're going to see the, the, the power source, the so-called universal power source that we talk about uh, in my book. We talk about the energy and that energy that gives that person that power. But I asked the martial artist one time, uh, although at the time I didn't understand it, where do they get the power from? And they said, well, it's from this energy out in, out in space or wherever it's at, it's all around us. But not the God of the Bible. No, 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 it's not the God of the Bible. And so what they're saying is that universal energy is the energy that they draw from. And that energy is not of God, but that energy is of a demonic realm. What would you say to Christian parents maybe who are looking for programs for their children in the area of self-defense or martial arts? Are there any safe uh, martial arts programs or things for, 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 for children? My 50 years of knowledge of the martial arts says the opposite. There are no safe martial arts. They're all connected, both spiritually and physically. There's something about, but they're connected to a Hindu religion. And I keep going back to that because that same Hindu religion, for example, was practiced at the White House uh, a couple of years ago, and they let a thousand children practice yoga on the front lawn of the um, um, of the White House. And, and that happened to be on the very holiest day that we have, which was Easter. Okay. Because you see sometimes ads for like Christian yoga. I mean, is that there's no such thing then really? Is there such a thing as Christian yoga? It's, it's impossible. Okay. You can't separate the two. Uh, once again, Hindus will tell you yoga is is uh, um, uh, is Hinduism and Hinduism is, is yoga. Zen Buddhism is the martial arts, and it's all interconnected. In my book, I lay that out of what these two uh, uh, connections are between uh, Zen Buddhism and uh, and the, and the uh, Hindu religion. Well, Vino, thank you. We appreciate your taking the time today. Thank to you. legitimize the martial arts and keep it uh, in a form in which it's palatable, where people won't believe that it's Hinduism or, or uh, Zen Buddhism, they've given titles to it such as, uh, of type, of given, given it titles such as Taekwondo University. This makes it palatable because people believe their children are being, um, are the children are being um, educated in some type of educational system. They are, but they don't realize what that education is or what's behind that education. Today, the martial arts, seductively blended with metaphysics and psychology, has begun to take on a more scientific facade. Once traditionally secret arts are now being taught as the means to achieve not only personal protection, but self-healing, self-awareness, and emotional regeneration. Self-empowerment has become the god of this age. According to both Asian and occult philosophy, this force or energy is said to dwell within all matter, the rocks, the trees, the planets, animals, and every human being. And although hidden, it is said to be only awaiting to be awakened an awakening which is achieved through the practice of Eastern meditation, breathing techniques, mantra chanting, visualization, hypnosis, and countless other occult practices. Although this mysterious power is called by different names in every culture, its principles and manifestations are always the same. For what is known as Qi by the ancient Chinese is called Qi in the Japanese art of Aikido. While to the Hindu, this same power is known as prana. 
To the Polynesian people, it is called mana or mana, energy. And by many New Age practitioners in the West, this spiritual power is called Oregon, vibrational or subtle energy. And this same spiritual energy today is being used and promoted by New Age gurus worldwide, is also demonstrated by Qigong and Reiki practitioners, by acupuncturists, acupressurists, Tai Chi masters, yoga gurus, and New Age holistic healers. To many, this power is called the God Spark, or Cosmic Consciousness. But regardless of its name, this esoteric power is from one and the same source, that old serpent, the devil. It is this power which is sought above all others. While most Western instructors will emphatically deny any involvement with the occult religions of the East, when we watch the practices of these men and women and compare their arts and the fruits thereof with the Word of God, there are serious questions which arise. It's working. This training is hard training. It developed your mental faculties. It turned into warrior and killer instinct. We develop him as a warrior. Shout Kali! Kali! A Christian instructor joined to a pagan style is spiritual adultery, unfaithfulness, and apostasy. I'm 100% Jesus. God can see my heart. People misunderstood, think, oh, how a Christian can fight an enemy. Spinning power! Oh, and now Brito goes for the triangle choke! Yeah, for sure, a Christian can fight an enemy, a Christian can go to a war, a Christian can go... We Christians, we're not different, we're just Christians. And I don't see nothing wrong with that. When Preston came up with the idea of having a fight club in the church, it was an easy thing to say yes to. Tough guys need Jesus, too. You guys like to see me fight another pastor? The spirit that I saw when I accepted Jesus into my heart was different. That spirit was one of love. It was one of peace. The spirit that I received from the masters, and I trained under some of the best in the world, uh, that spirit was one of violence. It was different. It was one of control. It was one of mastery over another person. It wasn't the same spirit in the Lord that I could love that person for who they were, not for what I knew and what I demanded of them. So, and that really is the attitude of many people people within the martial arts. They lord it over those who are under them. It becomes a superiority problem. It becomes a, an issue that they want control. They do have control over you in some sense uh, of control and they want to emulate their instructor and they want to give, they want to give that person something that they receive. So it's a spirit that is passed down from generation to generation and each succeeding generation uh, either becomes stronger or or they quit one or the other. They're all looking for that power, power over people, the power of violence. And they want to emulate that power in such a way that, that people will fear them. And it's the fear factor that most people don't understand. This is just one reason why it is important to begin with a good teacher. Submission is often represented symbolically by the simple ceremony of bowing to the teacher, whether to the instructor in the dojo or to that man's master it is considered the highest disrespect to fail to obey any given instruction by this man. Through Hindu breathing exercises and yoga, mantra chanting, visualization techniques, and kata, the monks were said to develop almost supernatural psychic and physical powers. There are many who begin training in these Eastern arts and say they will practice only the physical disciplines, laying their Eastern spiritual influences to the side. But according to the founders, grandmasters, and gurus of these arts, this is not only impossible, but futile in its attempt. It verily cannot be done. Yoga, to yoke or to join in union with the Hindu gods. Through the martial arts, Tai Chi and yoga, a door is being opened for the introduction and the acceptance of many mystical practices. When women come together and you let go of the judgment and you just be together as women and breathe together as women, uh, truths come out, ritual happens, connection. Yoga is the state where you are needing nothing, where you feel whole and complete. I would say it will save your life. It will change your life. It will make you so much more accepting of yourself.
Thus, the martial artist and yoga practitioner is said to achieve enlightenment and nirvana, beginning the path to immortal Sensei's, life. Senseis, gurus, masters, and instructors of the Eastern mystical arts. Taste and see, they say, for in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing both light and darkness, good and evil. This is the ultimate purpose of the Eastern mystical arts, the joining and merging of humanity with the forces of darkness. Millions are being deceived by the ancient dragon as they are told that we are on the brink of the final evolution of mankind. And in this final step, we will achieve godhood. As man is delving into the occult practices of the Eastern religions in his effort to see beyond the veil of our physical world, the doorway is being opened to spiritual forces and powers of which the Bible has warned us in no uncertain terms. Spiritualism takes many forms in the Eastern arts, but all of these, regardless of how they are clothed, are but the working of demons upon the human mind. Do we not hear many of these occult skills now falsely being called science? Although these esoteric skills were once reserved, for only those who had spent their lives in the dark arts. Now, in the end of this age, when the powers of darkness see that time has almost run out, the dragon is working to make these abilities not only desirable, but available to all who are willing to yield to his voice and take that step onto enchanted ground. Working through infiltration, rather than by a direct frontal attack, millions are now being swept away into a religion which requires no blood atonement, no cross, no personal sacrifice, no death to self, the world, or their Therefore, flesh. There is no surprise that the Roman Church has even recognized Buddha as one of her own, under the name Saint Josephat. For the word Catholic literally means universal, and as the universal church, she welcomes with open arms all religious beliefs into her fold, so long as they recognize the Roman Pontiff as the highest spiritual authority upon this earth. And what is this message which is to prepare mankind for a coming new age of peace? In order to have world harmony, all mankind must acknowledge equality of all faiths. One cannot be said to be better or worse than another. Neither can one be said to hold the truth and all others be in error. Why can't all the people of the planet live together in harmony? I just don't know. There have been three big walls that have caused wars throughout history. They are national, religious, and racial walls. The day the people of the world agree to construct one universal country, one universal religion, and one universal human race, by everyone becoming colorblind, everyone on this planet will be happy with every breath of life. And that which is declared as evil by the word of Jehovah is now looked upon as being good. The teachings and doctrines and practices of the martial arts, Tai Chi and Yoga, are in direct opposition to the word of God. And through these arts, man is being led into rebellion against his creator by transgression of God's holy law and his instructions in righteousness. We are bringing upon ourselves and all the world the sure results of our own arrogance and pride. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. In 1999 this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodists signed the same agreement, but as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of our day, it has greater power to deceive and to ensnare. Satan himself is converted, and after the modern order of things, he will appear as an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed, 
and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the Roman Church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. Woo! I told you you'd never forget it. Ha 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 ha